Let's pray together and we'll open God's word for this evening in the sermon. God, we thank you for your power and your love and your word. We know that it's living and active because it tells us so. We ask you to open our minds and hearts as you open it to us. We pray this in the name of Jesus, the living word. Amen. We are in a year-long study of the book of Acts and a second series now. We're coming toward the end of the second series called Growing Pains in our year-long study of the book of Acts. Um, how many of you have ever, have ever been part of a church conflict in your church attending years? Anybody ever been a part of a church conflict? How many of you have ever been part of a church split? Anyone ever experienced a church split? Um, can we admit that as Christians, sometimes we, get, we are a little goofy when it comes to conflict and dividing ourselves over things? We're a little unbalanced when it comes to dealing with disagreements in the church, and it has not always been a bright spot in our history. My personal, I shouldn't say favorite, but I think one of the more uh, odd stories of church division comes from uh, the early part of the 1900s uh, in a little town called Centerville, Georgia. Um, this is the Presbyterian church splits in this town were, became famous for a while, in a sad, infamous, I should say. The town's only 5,000 people, Centerville, Georgia. Uh, one original Presbyterian church in that town had an internal conflict in 1911 over whether they should take communion before the sermon or after the sermon. They couldn't resolve this conflict, and they divided over that issue, which in and of itself is silly. The splitting off church became known as the Centerville Reformed Presbyterian Church. Just four years later, another church split occurred over whether to have flowers in the sanctuary or not. The church that split off from that one was renamed Trinity Reformed Presbyterian Church of Centerville. A total of seven more church splits in this town in the Presbyterian denomination happened between 1915 and 1929 over various issues. And by 1931, the latest edition was named the Third Westminster Trinity Covenant Presbyterian Reformed Church of Centerville. <laughs> Need a big sign for that one. More church splits occurred between 1931 and 1975 over the conservative liberal bifurcation of that denomination, which is still going on today. And since 1975, a few more church splits over various issues has also occurred, bringing the total number of church splits in the Presbyterian Church in Centerville, Georgia, to 48. Think about that. It's a record. The last one was over whether or not it was a violation of the Sabbath day to check your email on a personal computer or not. I mean, we la you should laugh. You should also be a little just disgusted and sad about that. And by the way, it's not just Presbyterians. Baptists don't have a good history with this. Christians in general seem to, when it comes to little issues, to, they, they major in the minors and they fight over it. We divide. I think it breaks God's heart. If you've been tracking with us in this series, we, uh, we, we might have noticed a bit of a pattern developing in the book of Acts. That pattern is this pattern between the church focused inward in its own life and the church outward engaged with the world. In fact, in Acts chapter 1, all the church is barely born yet. All the believers are together in an upper room, the church inward. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes, they focus outward, and Peter gives the great first sermon in church history. In Acts chapter 2, later, they're, they're inward again. They're gathered together alone, and we read about their community and their fellowship and how they treat each other. In Acts chapter 3, Peter and John healing the beggar in the sermon, they're focused outward again. In Acts chapter 4, also focused outward as they're on trial and then later inward in their radical generosity and giving. In Acts 5, the Annas and Sapphira story, again focused inward. And later in Acts 5, they're arrested again, focused outward. So there's this pattern, internal and external, the church in the world and the church focused inward on itself. I think it's a necessary balance there. Two, uh, some, a healthy church should have both an inward and an outward focus. Uh, we've, I've seen this, and maybe you have as well, a church that's too inwardly focused, too worried about itself, how it's doing, how its own people are, will lose its sense of mission and purpose in the world. It will become ineffective, marginalized, and irrelevant. We see that happening sometimes. On the other hand, a church that's so externally focused, so concerned about those things outside of itself, that it doesn't take care of its own people and deal with its own issues, those issues can rise up and derail its mission and its purpose. The church has to have a balance of inward focus taking care of its own and outward focus reaching the world. It's not easy to be a balanced church. In fact, our own expansion project we're calling Growing to Serve. Many of you know about that. We're expanding here. We finished renovation of the East Campus, and we're prayerfully hoping to continue our expansion to the South uh, in a couple of years, if not sooner, that this can cause us. The point of expanding is to reach the world, to grow our capacity, to make an impact outside of our walls. 
But if we're not careful, we get so focused on how's the budget going? How's the construction going? We get inwardly focused and we lose sight of why we're even doing this. It's not easy. The early church in Acts was experiencing rapid growth and expansion. At the same time, terrible persecution and internal corruption and conflict. Chapter 5 ends with the apostles being released from jail for the second time, praising God that they were considered worthy to suffer for the name and asking God for more boldness. Let's pick up the story at the end of Acts 5, verse 42. By the way, I think sometimes when you read through a story like Acts, chapters and verse numbers can get in your way because you feel like this, there's, a, there's, a, there's a break. And not necessarily. Those were added later for us to look stuff up. But it's really written as one cohesive story. Let's back up and read verse 42 of chapter 5 through chapter 6, verse 7. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Christ is Jesus. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And, 12, and the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. First, we see here the problems of a growing church. The church is growing. Verse 42 tells us that at this time, they're meeting in the temple courts, corporate large group gathering, and from house to house, smaller house group gatherings. The church has both things going on on a weekly basis. They would all meet on the back steps of the temple, known as Solomon's Porch or Solomon's Colonnade. It was the only place where the thousands of them could gather and fit, the back steps of, the, of, of Solomon's temple. And they would meet there for, to hear the apostles teach, to sing psalms for a big church. And then during the week, they would meet in smaller groups in their homes because that's how they did it. Interesting, it's still going on that way, isn't it, in many of our, in different ways in our lives. And there are some, I think, in, uh, the church is large. There's no doubt it's large. You can't escape that fact. And in fact, let's read a few verses here. In chapter 2, verse 41, we read that we find out this about the church. Chapter 2, verse 41 so those who received his word were baptized, and they were added to that day about 3,000 souls. And again in verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. Do we have this up there? Acts 2.41, Acts 2.47. And then Acts 4, verse 4. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. In Acts 5, verse 14. And more than ever the believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. The point here is that the church is growing by 3,000, by 5,000, by multitudes, by multiplication. This is a large church. Now there are some people, and I've worked in large churches. I used to work in one larger than this church many years ago. There are some people who think that a large church is, has problems, is wrong, just because it's large. Church shouldn't be too large. I have a good friend who's a minister in a different part of the country, and he's convinced that 300 is the number. You get beyond that, and you're not biblical, he says. I don't know how he defends that when you've got 3,000 and 5,000 and numbers coming to, to faith. But his view is it should stay small. People attach maybe a value to size. But there is problems with multiplication. A growing church, the first problem is multiplication. A healthy church should be growing, yet a growing church will inevitably face problems or growing pains. Here in Acts 6, we see the first problem. It's the problem of murmuring. Look at Acts 6, verse 1 again. Acts 6, verse 1. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Let me explain what's going on there. The complaint, the, literally the Greek word for complaint is to murmur. There's a grumbling, a murmuring. People are talking, you know, amongst themselves. There's an issue going on. Here's the issue. It has to do with a cultural division between two groups of Jews who were converted to faith in Christ. 
You notice, in, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Some of you may have different versions. It's our, my version says the Hellenists and the Hebrews. Some of yours may say the Grecian Jews, or the Greek-speaking Jews. The Hellenists were Greek-speaking Jews converted to faith in Jesus Christ. So they're Jews by birth. Jews by, their parents were Jewish. They're born into Jewish families. But they've grown up in Greek culture with Greek language. And they are converted in their adult years to faith in Jesus Christ. That's what's meant by the Hellenists. Jew by birth, Greek by culture and language, but faith in Jesus Christ. Later, the Hebrews, when it mentions the Hebrews, the Hebrews are Jews by birth and Jews by culture and language. They speak Hebrew. They've grown up in Jewish culture, and they've been converted converted to faith in Jesus Christ. So both groups are Christians, converted to faith in Jesus Christ. Both groups are Jews, but they just speak a different language and have grown up in a different culture. And there's this division between them. The Greek-speaking Jews are saying, look, our widows from our Greek-speaking culture are not getting their fair share. They're being overlooked in what's called the daily distribution. Now, if you go back to Acts chapter 4, we read about people selling their property and selling their land and selling their goods and bringing the proceeds, the money, and laying it at the apostles' feet so that it could be distributed to those who had need, right? Remember that? That's the distribution referred to here in Acts 6.1. They're inside the church communities, there were some who had and some who had not, but the church, their hearts were so changed, they couldn't look at their fellow brothers and sisters and say, well, I've got mine, you deal with yours. They were caring for each other. And in the distribution, the, it's kind of like our food pantry, if you will, an ancient form of this. In the distribution, the apostles were in charge that somehow what was being distributed was a, at least in appearance or in actuality wasn't fairly distributed. There was... Uh, sort of a bias, a cultural bias. The, Gre- the Hebrew Jewish Christians sort of look down their nose at the Greek-speaking Christians as they're not quite as pure. They're not quite as, as, as close to God as we are. They're a, l- a little bit second class. And the complaint rises. There's this murmuring going on. Now, look at, notice what they did not do. What did the Greek-speaking Jewish Christians not do? They did not leave and start a new church for Greek-speaking Jewish Christians only. Fine, we're going to do our own thing. That happens all the time in our culture. They didn't do that. Nor did they start a fight amongst themselves. They brought this issue to the leadership. Now, we don't know if these Greek widows were being intentionally mistreated or if it was an innocent oversight. But it was a serious issue, and here's why. If the apostles, the 12 that walk with Jesus, the leaders of the church at this time in Jerusalem... If they ignore this, if they think, you know what, these are just a bunch of whining women, we've got other things to do, I'm not going to even worry about it. They would betray one of the central convictions of the gospel. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. Paul, who at the time of the Acts in Acts 6 is still Saul, Paul writes these words later after his conversion. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Those are powerful words. There's not Jew nor Greek. You're one in Christ Jesus. So the first century world was one of hierarchy and division. The social life was divided. And the gospel came and breaks down those barriers. Jew and Greek, slave and free, male and female, educated, uneducated. All the things which divide people and and make people mistreat each other and give prejudice and oppression, the gospel shatters those categories. The ground is to be level at the foot of the cross. So if the disciples ignore this, the apostles ignore this, what's going to happen eventually? What would have happened if they did nothing? Those Greek-speaking Jewish Christian widows and their families would eventually say, you know what? The church is no different than the rest of the world. There's prejudice and bias and mistreatment in here, just like there is out there. It's really no different here. And it would have damaged the message of the gospel. The mission, in other words, has to reflect the message. How we treat each other, how we treat people, how we care for each other, even those we disagree with, even those, especially those we have issues with, has to reflect the gospel we say we believe in, the God who owes us nothing and gives us everything by his grace. Years ago, I met a man who was, um, made an appointment to come and see me, and it was a very typical story. His wife was coming to Moms Together or Moms Connected or Moms doing things, 
and his, uh, his kids were getting involved in the midweek ministries. And he was sort of nervously interested in the church, you know, wanted to dip his toe in the water a little bit. But we met for coffee, and he had a list of questions. And he was like the king of the hypothetical situation. Like he would say, well, what if I told you? He began every sentence by saying, what if I told you? And he would make up some crazy story about his family. I'm going, man, either this guy is like from the weirdest family on the planet, or he's got a lot of hypotheticals for me. And so I'm trying to answer as best I can. And after a while, I, I asked myself, are any of those things true? He says, no, not really, but I just you know, I want to see how you respond. I said, why? What's behind all this? He said, well, I've been to lots of churches in my life, and I haven't really found any of them to live up to their message. He said, I just want to see if this church is any different. Interesting question. Skeptic from what he'd seen. Getting inside the church, he realized these people don't really act on what they say they believe. Okay, so how do the apostles respond then? They can't ignore it. It's too important an issue. How do they respond? This brings us to the priorities of a growing church. In, in chapter 6, verse 2, we see how they respond. And the twelve summon the full number of the disciples. So they bring the whole church together. They call a church meeting to deal with the issue. And they said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Now, we'll stop there for just a minute. The first priority of the growing church is the priority of preaching. We see it right there. I don't mean necessarily it's, it's first in importance for everyone, but it's clearly mentioned first here by the apostles. Lately, I've been feeling a little swamped in my role as a pastor at FBCG. I've been feeling like I don't have much, many margins, a lot of people to meet with, a lot of issues to deal with. And when I read this <laughs> two weeks ago in study for the sermon, I thought, huh, I could use this. I've been walking around the office saying, it is not right that I should deal with your petty issues to give up preaching the word. Don't bother me. I have heavenly things to think about, right? That's not what they're saying. It sort of reads that way in English, doesn't it? It is not right that you, peon, should trouble me who has this important job to do. They're not saying that. They're, they're not saying we don't care about the issue. They're simply saying, in effect, we can't do it anymore. We can no longer do it all anymore. There was a day in the church's history when it was small enough that the 12 of us could preach, could teach, could pray, and could handle all the administrative needs, but we can't do that anymore. It's way too big. So we have a choice to make. Either we give up this, and by the way, this message that we're preaching is what's gotten us this far. It's the fuel on which the engine, it's the gospel which the church runs. If we give up this, we give up our central conviction. But we can't ignore your issue. So what they're saying is simply, this thing has grown beyond our ability to handle it all. So what do they do? <clears throat> they, in verse 4, excuse me. They, they say, therefore, appoint seven men among you of good repute, full of the Spirit, full of wisdom, who we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. It's important for us to see the, that the apostles are not saying this is beneath their dignity or they're too high and mighty to serve people. That's not what they're saying. They're saying they only have so much time and there are central convictions that they have to be called to. They simply recognize they couldn't get it all done. And what they do is really pretty remarkable. That's the second priority. It's people. I don't mean second in terms of second class. I mean these two priorities go hand in hand. The relationships, the people, the preaching, and the word. This balance is critically important in the church. We must have both word and deed to have the impact God desires. Blaise Pascal, a, a great mathematician and theologian, he once wrote that, um, uh, in speaking about this issue essentially, he said, knowledge without zeal, so knowledge, information without passion to zeal is arrogance. You're all puffed up in your head, but there's no heart, there's no passion, there's no fire, no zeal. Zeal without knowledge, all passion without any grounding in truth, that's dangerous. That's, you know, extremists and zealots. And, and then he says, but knowledge plus zeal, information, truth, plus your heart, that's powerful. You have to have both in your life and in the body of Christ. In fact, the leadership shown here in Acts 6 is both deeply spiritual and practically sound. I think some people doubt you can have both. The apostles appoint a strategic delegation to deal with the issue. The first church committee. Now, I've been a part of some church committees that should never have been appointed. Maybe you have as well. Not all church committees are good things. Some of them are a waste of time. But this is a good one. This one is wise. It's smart to deal with the issues. This is something right out of a secular book on leadership, if you will. Pick out from among yourselves. Notice what the apostles say here. They don't, they don't say, we'll choose. They say, you choose 
from among yourselves seven men with these qualities. Good reputation. In other words, people agree. That guy's got a good, good reputation. Full of wisdom and of the Spirit. They don't say, pick the richest, most influential men from among you. They don't say, pick the, the, high, the, big, the high rollers in business. Pick the big shots. Men of good reputation, high character, wisdom, and full of the Spirit. This is also bathed in prayer and guided by the Spirit. There are some, I think, who fear the church becoming too corporate. I used to work in a very large church about 15 years ago before coming here. Um, the church was up about almost 18, 19,000 people, Willow Creek Community Church, and some of you may know of it in Barrington. Many years ago when I worked there, we were always reading uh, books on corporate books on leadership to apply them to the church context. Some folks thought, saw that as kind of, I don't know, this is the church. That's the business world. These two things shouldn't mix. And I understand that. The church is not a corporation. We're not for profit. We're not about our bottom line dollars. That's not what we're about. We're about the gospel and changing lives and the glory of God. On the other hand, it takes leadership and efficiency and wisdom to run the church, the organization of the church. Why should we can and should learn practices of organization and wise you know, efficiency and leadership without ceasing to be spiritually driven or grounded? Just a couple observations here before we move on. The leadership structure of, a, of the church, any church, must adapt and change and grow as the church grows. What would have happened if the apostles said, look, this is our job, you people aren't qualified, we're the apostles, we have to handle it all. We're the only ones who can lead. That would ground to a halt. I remember when I was youth pastor years ago, I used to feel like, you know, I could, I could make a group of 50 kids uh, feel motivated and energized. Of 25 to 30, I could feel like they, that I know them and they know me. I could really only disciple maybe 5 to 10. And our ministry, when I, back 15 years ago when I was youth pastor, was over 100. It was way beyond me. You've got to multiply leadership. You've got to reproduce it in people. Or the church gets stuck. Second, new ministry opportunities arise out of the needs that result from a growing church. We see this all the time in our church. You know, the best stuff going on in FBCG is not stuff that Pastor Brian and I sat behind in the closed room and figured out. Masterpiece Ministries, we didn't come up with that. You did. People from in our own church who saw a need, had a passion to meet that need. In fact, this, let me just explain this pastor-focused church versus people-focused church. Traditionally, and I think this has happened in North American evangelical church culture, sadly. People view uh, ministry as the pastor does ministry. They're the professionals. The people show up and they, they get ministered to. The pastor's the professional. He does ministry. He does it from the pulpit or in official church times and, and, and programs. But, you, but we're receivers. You're receivers. You, you receive it and you give and you applaud if you like it. You boo, you don't give, and you leave if you don't like it. But that's how it works. You don't boo, I hope, but you know what I mean. But the pastors do it, and it's done to the people. By the way, that's nowhere in the Bible. Nowhere. The best way to think of it is a people-focused church. Pastors best understood are equippers. That's why we say equip. To, to raise up you to have passion and desire and interest and ministry ability to go make a difference. To multiply that over and over again. Another example of, of this is our Shepherd's Heart ministry. And the Shepherd's Heart Care Center is the umbrella term we're giving to food pantry, uh, clothing closet, uh, compassion action, benevolence ministry, financial consulting for people, both those in generational poverty and those that are in situational poverty, loss of job, etc. cetera. We're, we're serving so many people. That ministry, Shepherd's Heart Care Ministries, is exploding right now. And it's, it is, it's raising up new leadership in our church. Third, new leaders are identified and raised up as the church grows. I just mentioned that. What do you notice? Look back at chapter 6 for a minute in Acts. Acts 6. Look at the list of names that are listed for us here. That are the seven men that are appointed. Uh, first, Philip. You heard about him last week. You'll hear more about him next week. Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. What do you notice about those names? Are those names Greek names or Hebrew names? Greek names. Why would that be important? Who, which are the widows that are complaining? The Greek-speaking Jewish widows are saying we're mistreated. 
The apostles say, you choose from among yourselves seven men that have good reputation and full of wisdom in the spirit. And they choose men who are Greek by culture because they want them to be well represented. There's just practical wisdom there. New leaders being raised up in the church because of this issue. Finally, this brings us to the purpose of a growing church. The purpose of a growing church. Verse 7. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Notice it does not say, so the widows got their fair share, stopped whining, and everybody went back to their business. It doesn't say that. That's not the point of this story. It doesn't say that so, so everybody was evenly distributed, and the apostles could go back to doing whatever it was they were doing. That's the goal of this story. The, the, I, I think, you know, sometimes this happens to me. An issue comes up in the church in our ministry. And I get focused on the, this particular problem, how to make sure everybody gets along, how to resolve the issue. Do you do that in your own family, in your own life? And I don't see that God might be using this difficult circumstance, this murmuring, this complaining, this sort of nuisance to, to further his kingdom. Isn't it amazing that something as seemingly insignificant as food distribution to a group of widows would lead to Verse 7, and the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly. That's the purpose. That's what we're here for. One of the things God's been impressing on my heart is that maybe the next time we come across a difficult issue that feels like i got to deal with this, maybe it's not something to be annoyed by or dismissed or overlooked. Maybe it's an opportunity for the word of God to increase and for those who are transformed by his grace to multiply greatly. That's what God's after. That's the purpose of a, multi a growing church. To glorify God by spreading his word and changing lives. That's why we're here. We are not to be distracted from that. This is what Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20, what we call the Great Commission. After his resurrection and before his ascension, he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. And in the last portion of, chap of verse 7 in chapter 6, I don't know if he caught this. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Did you catch that? Who are the priests? Hebrew priests. Looking, who are faithfully serving in the temple and ministering to the needs of God's people, looking for the coming of the Messiah. Jewish priests longing for the Messiah, and they found him. Isn't that amazing? And they found him. They had their hearts transformed. I don't know if you see the progressive cycle here in this story. The gospel is preached, people are reached. People are reached, the church grows. The church grows, there are going to be some issues. There are some issues, new opportunities raise up, the new leadership, and the gospel is preached. The gospel is preached, people are reached. People are reached, the church grows. The church grows, there are going to be problems. When there are problems, there's opportunities, and people grow, new leadership raised up, the gospel is preached. It's almost an intentional cycle. I think we have this false notion that it should be smooth sailing all the time. It is not to be. It was not from the beginning. We will face opposition. But sometimes, it's an opportunity. Every act of service matters. Every act of kindness matters. Every need in a person's heart, inside of our community and outside, matters. It's all an opportunity for gospel growth. I can't urge you this enough as we close tonight. Some of you I know pretty well, you're involved. Some of you I know a little bit. Many of you I don't know at all. I would guess many of you are coming. You come, you know, twice a month. You like it. You keep coming back. You feel mildly inspired on occasion by the sermon. You like the music. Your kids might even be involved. You feel like, okay, this is a nice place. We'll add this church thing, Christianity, to our lives. It's a good thing for us, good thing for our children. It makes us feel good about ourselves. Friends, that's, that's a myth of our culture. And it's robbing you of what God wants for you. It's not in the Bible. I fall prey to it. This is not a job for me. This is not a club for us. This is not something we come to like you go to the health club or your favorite restaurant now and then because so, you feel good or because you should. We're a part of something. And we have to keep reminding ourselves of this. We are part of a movement in the world that began way back in Acts 
to change the world, to impact lives. And if you think it's done by the professionals, the super committed, the ones who are paid to be on stage, you're missing it. Our community, the Tri-Cities, and the, will not be impacted for Christ the way it should be and God wants it to be if we don't do that. Our job is to proclaim this truth and to encourage you to make a difference where God gives you the opportunity. Every need matters. Every little issue is an opportunity for the word of God to spread and the number of disciples to multiply greatly. That's why we're here. Let's stand.